and the, she tries to walk away at one point and he like brings her back shoves mm-hmm. her against the wall I'm like like <laughs> <laughs> the bacon. make that so noise again that was good. Good. <laughs> that was good that was you can't replicate that that was in the moment <laughs> Anyang SAO, welcome to Afternoon of Delight, where Leah, Megan, and Amy, romance novelists, and your K Romance guides. So grab some deck bokey and listen to your new favorite unease. Hey, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Hi there. Happy 2024. Woohoo! Yay! It's a new year. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. At least for us, it's been for you guys. Uh, it's been a year for a couple of weeks, probably. It's probably been a an- <laughs> but for us, for it's, it's January third. Yeah, it's the first recording of the new year. So, and we're excited because it's been a it's been a little bit. We took a little bit of a break over the holidays. Uh, we didn't take a break from publishing our episodes, but we took a little break of, from recording. Right. Yes. So, yeah, ahead. I missed you guys. Yeah. I missed you too. I know Leah wasn't sure she uh, she wasn't feeling well this morning. And newly honestly, some life, newly some glass of wine. I know, <laughs> but I mean, I was great. I was totally fine with rescheduling. That would have been fine. But I was also like, but I was really looking. Forward. I know I was too, too because like I just finished this drama like two days ago, and I'm like still you know buzzing about it and dying to talk about it. So I mean, I would have totally been sympathetic to you being ill, Leah. Would that I have been the case? That. And I would have waited, Same. but I would have yes, been, we would have waited. I would sure. have been sad. But yeah, I would have been like, well, maybe I don't and know. And because I wanted to we see just... you guys too. Yeah, yeah me too. Me too. I so I am very glad to be here. And I also just didn't want to push back this drama because we'll get into it later. But I, ha- I have a lot of feelings about this drama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think we all do. This was a drama that you were watching, and you watched it first, Leah, on an airplane. Yeah, coming. Excuse me, coming back from Seoul, I watched this. Yes. Yeah. And you <laughs> were like, this rearranged my life. Like, this changed me. And I'm like, <laughs> no shit. And I was like, oh, man. Okay, okay. I'm going to... Because I was hesitant. I actually wasn't sure I was going to do, do mm-hmm. that. Um, and you and I can have different tastes sometimes. So yes. I was like, mm, I don't know. And then I was watching it and I was like, oh, my God, I get it. I get it. And I get why Leah got it. And this is also rearranging my life. Well, here's the thing is that you and I have pretty different tastes, except when we don't. <laughs> right. And I, I was thinking about the other day. I never know if I believe in like fate or, you know, divine universe interactions or whatever. But I was thinking the other day, like, you know, there's just people in my life. You that need I have, to like, believe e- in that or you will manifest nothing. OK, so yes, I guess I do. I do believe this. <laughs> But I mean, like, I sometimes, like, wrestle with, like, what do I believe yeah, and what do I think? Course. And there's these things that are, like, but I can't shake the fact that sometimes when I have connected with certain people in my life, and, like, not even romantically or anything, like, yes, romantically mm-hmm. sometimes, but a lot of times just, like, in life, there have been people I've been, like, I feel like I was either meant to have known you, I've known you before, I've, it's, like, there's just certain things. And, um, and so I have like a friend who I just like, I don't know, like I saw them like in writer Twitter at one point and I was just like, I need to be this person's friend. And I'm not a very like, I don't like grab people and be like, you need to be my friend. But I like did it with this person and like where you've been friends for, you know, like a long time. And then I was thinking about it and I was like, that's so funny. And and then I was like, it's kind of like what I did with you guys, but especially Megan, you in particular, because you were the first, because you were already friends with Amy but I remember I connected with you on Twitter. And actually, this ties into what we're we talking about on today. We too, didn't we? I think you and I connected. Mm-hmm. We did, but Megan was my gateway. Because Megan was your, you were friends with Me- Megan. And Megan c- contacted me I on reached Facebook. out to you. On Facebook, because we were in the same Facebook group. Right. Uh, okay. But I remember what Leah's talking about. Because we connected over a very specific tweet. That I was s- new adult. That it was, was the- new adult. And I said, <laughs> I want... I want a new adult novel, novel that's like Garden State, the movie. Yes, and I read it, and I was like, this is exactly what I've been saying. Yeah, and I was like, like, and I reached out to you, and I'm like, whoever you are, you are smart, because this is what I think, too. And this was, like, in 2011. Right. That's, like, literally when we connected. and yes. we Yeah. Because, so, that's the thing. When we connect over things, we do. We connect. So, both of us loved Garden State and went hard for Garden State. Yeah, I mean, it... It's Garden a good State movie. was my, it, I was my identity for a good three years. Like, I, mean, 
I feel like you and I both are never like, eh, I guess we're sort of into this. Like, it's like, you know, when we connect over something, it's like, it's like that. It's like Garden State or we connected over Duna and it was like, oh my God, we're both all in on Duna. Yeah. And I felt like Garden State just hit certain beats. And like, I felt like, look, I know, Amy, you love Scrubs. I know you do. (laughs) No shade. Like, it is my least favorite thing that I can think of to exist. You've watched how many episodes? (laughs) It doesn't matter. As soon as I look at it, I just want to punch every single person. <laughs> like, I have a visceral... Like, Friends, I would watch every single Friends episode ever made before watching, like, Two Scrubs. Why? I just... This isn't the I time don't or know. place, but I just... I need... Yeah. I was in college when it was this. out, and I just remember being like, when I see this, I feel fucking angry. And I had, like, friends who were like, I just like to watch this show. And I'm like, just fine. I'm going to go in a different room. Like, I just can't have it on the TV. <laughs> like, I made me... I'm sorry, Scrubs. Like, if any Scrubs are K-drama fans and they're listening and they're like, fuck you, Leah. I don't know. I can't explain it. But Zach Braff from Garden State, I didn't want to punch in the face. And I just... I enjoyed it because it felt like there was, like, elements of... I mean, yes, there's, like, manic pixie dream girl elements to it. But I just really enjoyed it. And I felt like that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what we feel like New Adult is in this mm-hmm. podcast and kind of like how we came into it as writing it and why we kind of like watching it as well. And I just felt like it hit some of those beats in a good way that like I didn't see. I thought that's. I'm going to save it for a little bit later, but I really thought at the time that's where the books were going. Me too. That is that is also where I thought. Yeah, and I was going. very, very wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, we, were, we were so wrong about where New Adult went. I agree. But um, yeah, I, I know. So I would say that though Duna kind of hit me in the same places that maybe Garden State did in a better way. I like Duna even more than Garden State, I think. But um. Yeah, but I know a lot of people had a lot of feelings about Duna. Um, and I think that's why I also hesitated to watch it. But then Leah was like, no, you got to go. You got to do it. You got to do it. And so we, I wasn't sure about Amy. I was a little worried because Amy could have gone either way. And so when Amy was in it, I was like, oh, this is it. Oh, my God. We have to record. I'm so excited to record. Yeah, no, about yeah. I don't. Yeah, this is 100% everything that I love about that age groups sort of story you know what i mean and that's what we said like i'm glad that going in leah was like this is like new adult and as soon as she said that i was like okay now i like get the mood i need to be in too does that make sense yeah because it's a di- you obviously you're treating these characters differently differently than if they're like 35 year old 100 percent. and we're gonna talk to, about you that you have to too. change your expectation of what you're looking you for in the romance do. when you're with absolutely. this age group because most K-dramas are late. Like, I'm realizing most K-drama characters are late 30s. That's like what everyone is. Almost. It seems like the K-dramas that I'm watching, they're all late 30s. So, okay. Here's my question before we get into, like, the script. Today we're going to be talking about college age-ish set romance. So, like, 18 to 25. What would you say you were, like... Like, if you had to, like, kind of, like, give your character profile <laughs> of this time, what would you say? Hot fucking mess. I was so messy. Like, I was, and I talk, I talk about that oh. when we talk about some characters later, that, like, some, some of these characters, not all of them, are a little wise beyond their years. And I'm talking about a specific side character, um, mm-hmm. where there is a scene where I was like, I would never have been mature enough to, you know, react that way. And I, like... I, yeah, I had zero, zero, I don't want to say control, but I I had zero understanding of my emotions, Mm -hmm. like, you know, like, like at that age, um, I just, I just felt a lot of things. Right. And it was very messy. It was very, very messy. messy. I was dramatic. So dramatic. I, yeah, I would pick fights. Uh, with my boyfriend, now my husband, just because I thought that we needed to be in constant turmoil. Like, I thought, I thought, like, love was, like, <laughs> and I don't know why, because my parents, like, I, I didn't witness that growing up, so I don't know mm-hmm. why I was like that. But I was, like, I thought I had to constantly be in, like, turmoil. I mean, I was... Drama. Like, abs- you feed on the, I fed on the drama. Yeah, for sure. Love the drama. Mm-hmm. Love the drama. And so, yeah. <laughs> 
So it's the thing I try to like picture how I was and then how these characters are reacting. And it does help me give them grace as opposed to when I'm watching. Yeah. Like a 39 year old woman in a drama, do something I, or a, a man or any, I don't give them as much grace. Cause they should know better mm-hmm. by then. Yeah. I feel like I, I didn't know how to set normal boundaries. Yeah. And I didn't know how to, well, I guess, no, I don't want to say normal. I hate the word normal. I'm really apologizing for saying that. I didn't know how to set healthy boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to be in relationships. And I was like learning and making a mess of things. And like, there were times towards like the end. And and my, my active dating period in a new adult was very, very short. Like if we're going 18, I met my husband when I was 20. So, like, we're talking about a short time frame. I made a cock up mess of, like, (laughs) a lot of, I I really, like, dove into that period and just, like, made a whole mess. But I was, yeah, I was young, immature, but maturing. And my consequences, there were consequences sometimes for what I did. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I was also emotionally prepared always for the consequences of my actions. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. And when I had, I mean, I was maybe slightly coddled growing up. So then when I did have to face the consequences of my actions, that was really hard. (laughs) But I did when I was in college on my own. And uh, I think it's it's also a time. Yeah, I think it's also a time, at least for me, where you, you have more autonomy than you did when you were a teen. But I still based a lot of my own self esteem on how other people saw me, especially mm-hmm. in relationships. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, and yeah. Being, being liked or wanted to me was very validating. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I've really moved away from that as I've gotten older. Oh, yeah. I mean, I still have that, I think, probably the most. But I would say when I was a teenager, it was crippling how badly I needed to be liked. And if I thought some stranger didn't like me, like, if I, like, cut someone off in my car and they gave me the finger, I was like, oh, my God, my, my day is ruined. My day is ruined because that person doesn't like me. I mean, Oof. it was like, yeah. now I can be like, oh, I made a, made a mistake. Sorry, buddy. And if you think about the societal control that has to, like, make us like that as young people, as women, to mm-hmm. be like, you have to be liked in order to, like, matter. And if yeah. you're not liked, like, what a good yoke of control that puts. Yeah, and also the decisions I made in order – to be liked say at um internships where uh maybe there were there were like sexual harassment sexual comments and i would and i would let things slide because at the time i was like oh i gotta be liked i have to you know and now i look back and i'm like i just want to take her i also didn't know yeah i didn't know you know just uh, so much stuff yeah such a weird time in your life and uh, i mean that is one of the reasons I like to watch new adult or read new adult or I, I did for a long time was because I wanted to see them mess up and still get their happiness in the end. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Cause like in real life, it obviously doesn't happen. So. Well, let's jump into what we're talking about today. Yeah. Cause I feel like we're just going to like be grappling throughout. So, okay. I'm going to go, I want to read the Asian wiki synopsis. Okay. <laughs> because I, you know, I like, I, I, I had yeah. some things to say. Okay. <laughs> so Iduna played by Bay Susie was a member of an idol girl group. She was the main vocalist and the most popular member of the group, but she suddenly announced her retirement. Now she stays at a share house located near a university and rarely goes out. Meanwhile, Yi Won-jun, played by Yong Sung jong is a university student. He is a warm-hearted, ordinary young man without anything special in his background. <laughs> he begins to stay at the share house where Yi Juna resides. His warm heart gives Yi Juna comfort. They get attracted to each other. <laughs> That's Jeez. how they're selling the drama. Thanks, Asian Wiki. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, Whew. I just want to say, like, I was at work. Shh, don't tell anyone. When I was filling out this uh, the script for tonight, and when I saw them call Wanjun ordinary, like I 
wanted to do a spit take. If I had something in my mouth, I wanted to spit it at my screen. Like, <laughs> how dare you, Asian Wiki? How dare you <laughs> call my Wanjun ordinary? Do you see what my name is tonight? No, what is it? Hang on. Extraordinary Wanjun. Oh, he is great. I love him. I love him. Yeah. I love him. He's great. Yeah, so let's hear your re-blurb, Amy. Yeah, and I'm so glad that Leah gave Amy this task, because Leah's yes. the best at or, or Amy's the best at this. I, yes. I felt, like, a lot of pressure, though, because... Oh, no. Because, well, because I, A, I was at work, and I was like, oh, shit, I gotta do this for tonight. And B, like, I wanted to do this drama right. But, like, please keep in mind that I was at my day job and not supposed to be doing this. Um, but I did my best. Okay, so a re-blurb. When the spotlight becomes too much, Iduna, a love-starved idol who has lost the ability to sing, escapes to a share house to regroup. Plagued by loneliness, she chain smokes while staring at her phone, waiting for her manager to text. Um, but Pak and Wu only sees Duna as a paycheck. If she's not on stage, she might as well not exist. Iwan Jun, tired of the commute from home to university, finally leaves the nest and rents a room in the same house. Still hung up on his first love, Kim Jinju, he has no interest in beautiful idols. In fact, he doesn't even recognize who Duna is the first time he sees her. And once he does, he only sees her as a selfish celebrity who thinks everyone should bend to her will. When Duna lets Wan Jun slip past her walls, an unlikely friendship, and soon after romance, blooms. Can their love withstand the public scrutiny that comes with dating an idol, or will do not have to break Wan Jun's heart to put herself center stage? Whoa! Look at that conflict at the end. Way Dang. to go! Stakes, baby. Yeah. Instead of they get attracted to each other. <laughs> like, what is that? They get attracted to each okay, other. Okay. I mean, like, obviously, we've talked about this before. Like, this is definitely a Western thing that we're doing right now, right? Oh, like, yeah, it's totally. obvious, it's, And obviously, we also know that something gets lost in translation from, you know, Hangul to English. And right. so right. we know that Asian Wiki is doing its best to just let us know what's going on. Yeah, and I, also think, yeah and I also think that, that, that South Korean viewers have their own, like, they're used to reading blurbs right. a certain way. So this probably is a blurb that they're like, yeah, great. I love this blurb because this is, that's what... They're used to. We just like to rewrite it for. We we need the stakes. You know. Is basically what what we need. That's yeah. we need we need. What is the conflict? What is going to keep these people apart? Why might they not end up together? We need to know. That's what romance is all about. Is yep. the journey of will they or won't they until hopefully they finally yeah. do. What's keeping them apart? Right. All right. So, Megan. We had Amy do her specialty, which is blurbing. Yeah. Well, actually, I just thought she, like, yeah, she was amazing at the re-blurbing. Okay, so Megan, you're good at tropes. What are the tropes in Duna? I might have missed some, because I was trying to think. So I said forced proximity, obviously, Mm because they are in the same share house, and they have to be very close together. And they always run into each other. I mean, that's kind of like the whole thing. Celebrity romance, which is definitely a trope that some people like. I also kind of have country boy meets city girl because they kind of have very different, you know, he's like kind of from like a suburb or a rural part of Korea. And she's like this like city girl from Seoul and a celebrity. And then love triangle, which is kind of a trope. Yeah, those are great. And I I mean, the love triangle is a total trope. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So this drama has the same director, uh, Lee Jung-kyo, as Crash Landing on You. Any comparisons that you noticed between Crash Landing on You and Duna without doing any overt spoilers? So I did not know, just so you know. So I only thought about it until I, like, when I saw this question. So it wasn't like I watched Duna thinking, oh, this reminds me of Chloe. Um, But looking back... um, I can see how this director really knows how to make scenes intense. So, of course, Duna had much less, like, external... Well, I mean, there was external conflict, but, I mean, come on. It's much going to compare to, like, the grandiose plotting uh, of Chloe. Because it was a totally different type of drama. Which we'll actually talk more about how Duna is 
a much more like romance focused drama. But anyway, I feel like the director knew how to make really make scenes that felt that it just really made them feel important in the way they were shot. So like when they use the slow motion effect, and I can see that that now has reminded me a little bit of the way Chloe was directed. Um, we'll get to this scene later because I'm going to talk about it. But but the first kiss of Duna was reminiscent to me of kind of like the slow motion shot of Captain Ree like stepping over the line like into South Korea to kiss uh, mm-hmm. Suri. Actually, he did it twice, but <laughs> um, just that like, I don't know. I just think the the effects the director used, I could now see similarities. Yeah, I had no idea when I was watching. And it was afterwards when I was, like, losing my mind and, like, messaging both of you. And Leah's, like, sending me articles to, like, call me down. And she said it was the same director from Chloe. And for a second, I was thinking same writer. Um, but then when I saw the script, I was like, oh, same director. And that totally sort of clicked in. Um, because for me, what I saw as similarities was a little bit of like the slow burn of it. Like even for such a short drama for what was it? Nine episodes. Um, it was a good slow burn of like first, like, we're just going to keep running into each other. You kind of annoy me. Now we're all of a sudden friends and there's definitely an attraction, but we're not going to admit the attraction, you know, kind of thing. And I feel like that was very similar to, you know, Sari when she was stuck in North Korea. Like she was definitely a nuisance to start. Right. And but we've got the forced proximity, so they have to keep seeing each other and they have to have interactions. And we see them, you know, warming up to each other. Um, And it. You know, it it starts as something very platonic and then becomes something really beautiful. But what I also really loved is the subtle looks, which I think we got a lot of in Chloe as well, if you're looking for them. So sometimes Duna or Wanjun, you know, giving a subtle look to each other that without saying anything tells the audience how they're feeling about each other. But what I really Mm. loved, and this is not a big spoiler, is there's a scene where all the housemates are sitting outside eating together around a table. um, And Jinju is there with the guy who likes her, but all she can do is look at how Wan Jun looks at Duna. Ugh, yeah, you're right. (gasps) And it made me think of this scene in Switzerland in Cloy when, you know, in the flashback when, you know, he, where Kat, where, Zhang Hyuk has just stopped Sari from like jumping off the bridge um, and asked him to take a picture of him and Sadan. And um, you can see Dan looking at how Sari and Zhang Hyuk are looking at each other. And that's when she goes into the store and buys the Kit Kat, you know, because she's so pissed off at like how he's looking at her and he doesn't look at, you know, how he's looking at Sari and he doesn't look at her like that. And she's just this stranger. So I think that that is possibly like a a sort of tell of this director one that i really like is just the if you if the actor can do it well then it has a great effect with that sort of just subtle look and that that sort of person on the outside looking in at how the other people are looking at each other that's a really good point and i do have to just say that there's like two scenes there's that i can think of off the top of my head in Duna, which are similar, it's like they're all, there's like three people who are just reading each other's facial expressions in a group of people. And so the acting necessary to do that is crazy to me. And as a viewer, I was like, I think like, I can also interpret what's going on. Yeah, it's really mm-hmm. cool. It's like you're, you're, in right. a, you're in on the secret. Yeah, that's a really good thing to bring up. So one quote he says, which I like, and I feel like it's pretty similar to kind of the vibe of Chloe, is um, the director, Lee Jung-hyo, says, I aim to portray the fantastical relationship in a realistic life. light. Oh, I love that. And then he says, life's trajectory remains uncertain, regardless of where people are now, how they're living, or whether their paths cross again, they forever hold special places in each other's memories. I like that a lot. And I I feel like that very much is like Duna meets Chloe is like, that's like the core stories. There was also another thing in here that he, he said that he like to him. And this is where it is interesting because what I think he does in both Chloe and in Duna 
is that there is this element of the fantasy, right? Like either like the South Koreans swept over this like huge border into North Korea and like what happens, or we have this like so-called average Joe, although obviously not meeting this like, you know, idol. And so we have this kind of fantasy, but he grounds it very much in realism because when Siri goes to North Korea it's just like going into like a town, right? Like, you know, there's like the villagers and it's real life and like what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then in this, it's like, it's all going down in kind of like a general share house environment. And so there's kind of these fantastical things that are happening in very like realistic, easy to understand worlds. I love that. I agree. The drama is adapted from Naver Webtoon, The Girl Downstairs, by Min Sung Ah, who also has a screenwriting credit for the drama. Online, the complimentary consensus is that this was a quote-unquote back-to-basics drama free of unnecessary subplots. I've also seen some criticism that it was too slow and too slice of life. Thoughts on either of these? So I would say I did notice and was very aware while I was watching the drama that it was condensed down to the romance truly um there were few scenes that were not about the romance and like i'm curious if you guys if you thought the same thing because it seemed to me that there were a few scenes that were not about the romance and even if the main leads like weren't in the scene together the scene still felt somehow connected back to the romance so it worked perfect for me based on like the age of the characters uh, you know, as we're talking about this first love and young love is like so all consuming and it feels so big and so important and it feels so, fills so many aspects of your life. And so for me, Duna was just short and, and um, it was a short and emotionally intense drama. And sometimes that's all I want. You know, I'm not always in the mood for a grandiose plot. I don't always want to, like, figure things out. <laughs> I, as much as I love The Time Called You, I can't watch A Time Called You <laughs> all every <the> week. <laughs> right? I cannot do that. Like, my brain would explode, okay? <laughs> so sometimes I just, I, I don't know. When I watched Duna, I was just in the right frame of mind for it. And maybe if you weren't, and I can like see how maybe this drama would frustrate you. Like I can see other sides of it, but I would say just for me, it hit me at the right time. I think I went in with the right expectations. And then I also, it to me, it exceeded those expectations. Yeah, I think a drama that basically focuses on the romance as the story is better condensed. So, I mean, it was, it was nine episodes. And to me, that's, you have plenty of story with the romance to fill those nine episodes. And even when it wasn't focused solely on their romance, we had a, a fun secondary romance too, <laughs> that came in like halfway through, which was so enjoyable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, we had a little bit of external conflict, but the external conflict was more emotional than it was anything else, you know, cause it was, it, you know, it had to do with Juna's job, but yeah, I, you know, it never felt slow to me at all. Yeah, it did like, to me. Yeah, the characters were the whole story, but mm -hmm. I think the characters were so richly drawn and acted. Oh, so good. Including the rest of the ensemble. Like, nobody nobody was a plot moppet, really. Mm -hmm. You know? Not that, no, like, Jinju was not. No. And they could have made her one. So I, I felt like... You know, when it was slice of lifetime, I felt like I was part of the crew. Like that that time around the table that I was just talking about. Like I felt like I was there with them, and that I was noticing these subtle looks too. And I freaking love that. So, no, wrong. you're wrong if you think that it's wrong. too slow or too slice of life. No, everybody is entitled <laughs> to their opinion, even if it's not the right one. Yeah, I I also do want. To, I mean. Several times where I wanted to be sitting around the table with them drinking drinks. I want. I I'm like, like, I want to live in a share house. I know. I was like, why? <laughs> oh my god, this is I, this is so. Cool. But I want the whole bottom floor like Duna, and everybody else can have their little rooms. Mm -hmm. Dude, mm -hmm. you all live. You all lived in share houses, right? I have. Like, I have. I share. I shared a house with four of my friends in my twenties, um, but it was not. I, w I was like Juan June, like I was just going back to school to get my teaching certificate and everybody else was already out of college and just starting their jobs. So we were definitely like new adults still. Um, 
but it was yeah it was it was chaos we had a squirrel in our house once it was it was a good time yeah we i lived in a townhouse so in my college town there was like a row there were you know townhouses and so i lived in a in the end unit of a townhouse with three other girls and <laughs> beside us was then uh like a group of, of college boys and the thing is is these row homes i mean talk about like a fire hazard and like building code. So the top, the attic was not fireproofed. So like if a fire started in one unit, it would have gone through all of them. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we could go up in our attic, go over to the boys attic and just walk down the stairs, which looking back, I'm like, those boys could have just come over in our beds. Like anytime, like cannot believe that like (laughs) we live like that. But I mean, yeah, we, it was, it, but it, it was an absolutely chaotic time living living with those three other girls i mean i love them they're like my friends they're still my friends but like we (laughs) we had our share of fights we had like i mean just taking care of a house together like we didn't know what we were doing are you kidding me yeah i lived in quite a few share houses like during college like i moved out of the dorms and then just went share house to share house with friends I mean, I had one house where I literally kicked the back door in one night. I came home drunk from the bars and couldn't find my keys. And I'm like, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kick a hole. And I kicked a hole like Rambo style to the door. (laughs) And the next day my roommates are like, it's winter in Montana. And there's just like a human hole in the door. And they're like, what do we do? I'm like like a person shaped hole hole. with the arms out. (laughs) I mean, I sucked kind of as a roommate. And they were like, what? I had another roommate like. I would come downstairs to make breakfast and he'd be passed out with like a bong in his lap eating hamburger helper in the middle of the day with porn going and a cat eating the hamburger helper off of his like chest. So I just think like, but I loved, I mean, I didn't love that, but I loved to share houses in general. Like it was ridiculous. Uh, Neil lived in a house with nine, my husband, my now husband uh, in college, he lived in a, in a house with nine other guys that had no heat. It was a total slum house. And uh, nine, they, just, nine did they guys. huddled together, nine yeah, guys, and no, they sleep together? Like, they would sleep in, like, they bought, like, heavy-duty sleeping bags, and they would sleep in sleeping bags. I remember going over there sometimes. I didn't go over often because it was horrible. Like, who wanted to go? So I remember going over there, and it'd be, like, 9 o'clock in the morning, and they're making eggs wearing parkas and, like, <laughs> ski gloves, like, making eggs on their stove because they had no heat in Pennsylvania. Like... <laughs> crazy i can't believe we <laughs> and, la- and landlords are like that's fine yeah the landlord's like i don't care i remember the boys wanted bricks for something so they just took them off the chimney like once they just went up to the roof and just took some bricks down i don't know i mean i'm not even gonna get into not it. even I mean, like a space heater no, uh, i mean I, no because they didn't want to pay for the heat well i remember that neil drove his car with a screwdriver in it well N- uh, neil had a car that <laughs> Neil had a car that, this is, I mean, God, new adult time's crazy. Neil had a car that it idled so badly. So, like, if we were, it was this old Toyota Corolla and, like, from the 80s. And I went to school in 2001. So, um, it would idle so, so badly that, like, it like it shook. You couldn't talk. So, and I didn't know because I remember we would, it was just an automatic car. And so whenever he would, like, stop at a stoplight, he would always put it in park. And I remember when we first met, and I remember thinking, that's really weird. Like, I don't have to do that to my car. I wonder why he does that. Because he was like, didn't want me to, like, he didn't want my bones to rattle (laughs) on, like, our first date. Because then once he realized I wasn't going to, like, break up with him, he just, like, let it go. And so we'd be sitting at a stoplight and be like, 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 cheeks were, like, flapping. Like, it was. (laughs) Okay, anyway, let's. Okay. So, all right <laughs> yeah well, okay so what did you think about duna did you think it was slow leah slice of life what did you think yeah so no but i mean like i also have a little bit more patience for this but the thing is to me is it was very pared down like when we get to back to the basics yeah. i felt like the romance was the most important and if it wasn't the main romance it was like secondary romance and then i there were some found family friendships But I didn't feel like we had any, like, filler plots. Because, I mean, we're going to talk about it later, but I could have handled more K-drama. Or K-pop, honestly. Oh, yeah. I felt like we really took everything down to, like, these relationships. But honestly, for me, it was fine. 
Yeah, well, I know. And like sometimes I have a criticism with dramas is that they get so plotty at the yeah. end that they then forget the characters. Um, yeah. That happened personally, that happened for me in The Worst of Evil, uh, that drama. And so it felt kind of good that this drama was just like, nope, we're not doing any of that. We're just yeah. going to keep focusing on the characters and it felt like even to me then you know and perfectly I, and paced yeah i agree i agree so i pulled up a definition of new adult on wikipedia and it says this new adult or na fiction is a developing genre of fiction with protagonists in the 18 to 29 age bracket I feel like that's a stretch. Yeah, that's a stretch. I think that's it, too old at the other end. Yeah, yeah, I would say like we're really going like 18, 24. Yeah. Five. I was going to say 24. Yes. I was going to be like 24 is about it. Yep, not even yeah. 25. 24. So St. Martin's Press first coined the term in 2009 when they held a special call for fiction similar to young adult fiction that can be published and marketed as adult, a, so, a sort of older YA or new adult. New adult fiction tends to focus on issues such as leaving home, developing sexuality, and negotiating, and negotiating education and career choices. The genre has gained popularity over the last few years, particularly through books by self-published best-selling authors such as Jennifer L. Armentrout, Cora Carmack, Colleen Hoover, Anna Todd, and others. The Genre originally faced criticism, as some viewed it as a marketing scheme, while others claimed that readership was not there to publish the material. In contrast, others claimed the term was necessary. A publicist for HarperCollins described it as a convenient label because it allows parents and bookstores and interested readers to know what's inside. So some examples of the new adult genre include Sarah J. Moss's A Court of Thorns and Roses and, Thor and Throne of Glass, Jennifer L. Armentrout's Wait for You and Blood Ash series, Colleen Hoover Slammed, Cora Carmack's Losing It, Kendall Ryan's The Impact of You, and Casey McQuiston's Red, White, and Royal Blue. So, any thoughts on this description of new adult? Because look, we lived through this. We <laughs> so did. I feel like we really fucking know this. Right. Right. Like, is this is this is this article like older because it says the, no this is this is the wikipedia like if you pull up new adult so Wiki, this is current because it said it's like yeah. developing i'm like it's been developing yeah. for like over a decade like mm -hmm. yeah past a decade so i yeah. thought it was interesting i don't think a lot of people are updating the new adult on Wikipedia. Yeah. okay so i would say like yeah i mean this is generally a good description uh i think new adult as like a marketing tool in publishing from about 2010 to 2020 became something pretty narrow <laughs> which i think we can talk about but which is a shame to me because i i think there's a lot of us that thought this had a lot of potential and um it kind of uh, never went the direction that a lot of us wanted it to um so to me there was always a journey of, I would say, emotionally immature characters, having that first real love and heartbreak uh, with a happily ever after, where the safety nets of our parents and our families or any sort of support system that we would have had growing up aren't like right below us, you know, like we might, we might have support from a distance, but it's not the same as like living in your parents' household or, um, and as a, as a minor. So maybe the characters are at college or maybe they have their first apartment, their first job or whatever. Uh, but new adult to me has always had an aspect that made the characters learn something about themselves that they'll look back and think, yeah, like that was the time in my life where I learned something about what it was like to be an adult. To be a, you're a, you're a new adult. Right. You're a fresh new baby adult. <laughs> yeah. The whole like marketing aspect of it never took off like it should have like you won't go into a bookstore now and find a new adult section like that that last we thought that that would happen that Indeed. last that there was like a blip so like yeah you're not walking into a bookstore knowing oh this is going to be a little bit more mature no those books are now in the adult romance section yeah. um sarah j mass is an interesting part of this situation i think because the court series i haven't read throne of glass but i don't think throne of glass is as sexy as the court series is, but I don't know because I haven't read it. Um, but the court series, and this is, I don't know where I'm pulling this from, but I'm pulling it from hearing it somewhere. Because um, now it is being marketed as adult. But initially, I think it was meant to slide into that new adult 
space. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that new adult really only took off in contemporary and even more so it was like stronger with indie writers than it was in traditional publishing. Yep. So um, Sarah J- so Court, Court like at our indie bookstore and like whenever I've seen it shelved, it's shelved YA. It was. It was. Shelved in- yes. No, so that's still, what happened. Like, still, oh, like, still? Even, even with yeah, the like, new covers and everything? Well, the other day I was at the bookshop with my friend and she's like, oh, this looks good. And she was in YA fantasy and it was Oh, Court. okay. So that's, so I thought, I thought that it was now being marketed as adult because she now, now she does like her Crescent City stuff is definitely marketed as adult. Yeah. Right. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because I think that that was intended to be marketed as N.A., but N.A. didn't take off in the fantasy space. Well, the heroine so, in court is 19. Yes. And it's not... I I think that's where it gets kind of iffy, and it's, this, it's the same if we look at, like, fantasy in, you know, like, K-drama, is ages and, and development is different when you're talking about magical worlds, too. So it, I think that that's why it kind of got muddy there. Um, mm-hmm. But for the most part, I do think that that was a decent enough definition, and I like all of, of what you're saying, too, Megan. Like, to compare it to YA, I feel like YA is coming of age while you have the safety net of home and adults, like you said, right? You have that safety net still. You can make a mess, and you've got other people there to help you clean it up, whereas NA, or new adult, is more about coming into your own without the safety net. It's messy, and characters make mistakes, but hopefully learn and grow from them. And I think Duna and Wanjun both made a hell of a mess of their relationship because they were both in uncharted territory. Um, But I do think that they learned a lot about what it means to love and support someone and how the right kind of love is something worth fighting for. Um, But I think when you're falling in love for the first time, you don't know what love is supposed to be like. And so... When it is messy, sorry, when it is messy and possibly even a little toxic, and I'm not saying them, I'm thinking of something else, you know, that happened to Duna, um, you know, that a toxic relationship can feel like love Mm -hmm. and you Mm -hmm. need to experience it the right way to know that it's not love. So we all started in this genre. Why? And any general thoughts on where publishing is with this genre? Yeah, I mean, so um, you guys have probably heard our stories, but we did all publish new adult books uh, with publishers in 2014. That was what that was what we did. That's how we met. Uh, we were in Facebook groups of you know new adult authors, so like we were really in that community uh, at the time. And uh, so at the time, I did really love reading it, uh, and my kids were also little. Uh, at the time I was in my early thirties and I was like with little kids at home and I wasn't working. <laughs> and I sort of like missed that fun time in my life. I think, you know what I mean? And so it was kind of fun to like reconnect with some of the lessons that I learned at the time. Um, I would say I'm not as interested in, in writing or reading about that time now, but K-dramas, of course, always give me new ways to enjoy things. And so Duna, to me, was still the, was really this, like, fresh new take. And in a way, um, you know, really, really hooked me into it. I would say, I mean, God, I don't know. New adult publishing now is... I feel like a lot of it has shifted into dark romance as well in the indie spacing. And then I think uh, traditional publishing doesn't really label it that way or do it at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, for me, when I started writing, I started writing historical romance. That was my very first book. I got my agent through a historical romance. This book was very bad. And I don't know. <laughs> I'm like still like surprised that she like took me for it. <laughs> Um, but right away, she was basically like, "Mm, this book is like, not great. Like we can do something with it, but I feel like there's other things you could do. And then that's when she was like, do you have any college age stories? Because the new adult market's really hot. So I didn't enter publishing even with like an aim for new adult. 
So it kind of like found me and I was like, well, yeah, I mean, I've got like college stories up the butt. Like yeah. college was like my time. <laughs> and that was my time. I shine. <laughs> yeah. like, Do I? <laughs> Do I Emma? And so I was like, I mean, I studied abroad and like met my husband and there's a story. And she's like, excellent. She's like, I don't think that there, there's been a lot of like study abroad new adults. Why don't we pitch that? And so that's what we did. And that's how my series upside down or off the off the map series happened. Um and then from there, you know, I kind of stayed a little bit with a new adult and then moved up to contemporary adult. But for me, look, I'm always going to be open minded to new adult stories just because I think I I'm generous with the messiness that happens at that time. So even if now, like, that's not like all I'm seeking out to read or all I'm seeking out to watch, I am going to like it if I get it and it's good. And by my definition of good is it has to be messy. Like they you have do to love make, messy. Yeah. Well, they have to make that because yeah. I mean, if you're just like perfect, you're like, well, no, yeah, it's got to be messy. New adult, it's gotta like, be messy. like what you're saying, like new adult, like you give a lot more grace to both the hero and the heroine for being stupid at love because they don't know how to do it yet. Yeah. And I mean, look, do we still know how to do it? Is no. my question. No. And so <laughs> exactly. I find that like in some ways finding those like original stories and then like, where was I going at that time? watching other content around that time and then kind of unpacking it to like, where am I am now taking stock in myself? Like I, I'm not a narcissist, but I tend to like look for like the why and like the bigger, like sometimes it's fine to just enjoy something. You turn it on, you watch it and you move on. But there's times where I like to do like the bigger, like why, why this, why does this get me? And in some ways I feel like there's like a lot of your core stories are getting developed around that time. And so the idea of core story being like with a writer, I don't know if it holds up perfectly, but I mean, I've heard things like, you know, we are all just kind of reworking like one core story, our entire career of like, what's, what's our big, what's our big question or what's our big grapple that kind of like you can pare back everything away. And like, there's one thing we're always looking at. Mm -hmm. I like that. I agree. Um, and so, yeah. And I mean, like with Upside Down, like my first drama, I pitched it as, cause Jane Eyre is look, I've, I've kind of grown on from Jane Eyre, but like, I really liked Jane Eyre. It's very fucking problematic. And that's fine. I uh, I knew it was problematic at the time. I just don't think I'm like as wowed by like the Mr. Rochester factor at this point. But I, I wanted to very much be like, what would like a baby Mr. Rochester look like? You know, like the Byronic heroes were really a, it for me when I was younger. I think in my 40s now, Byronic heroes are just less fascinating. But those were like the mad, bad, dangerous to know kind of guys. And um, now I'd like more like I want to read a book and I don't know. Tell me I'm good at writing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fix my door and tell me I'm on the baseball team. Fix my house yeah. and tell yeah. me I'm amazing. Yeah, you know that's that sounds hot right now. Not like <laughs> oh I'm so messed up. I'm so intense. No, no I don't. I don't want that anymore. My no. first one, my first book was a study abroad book too, and based mm. on my experiences studying abroad, um, and it was not how I met my husband or ex-husband or anything like that, but I did have a huge monster crush on somebody. I, I studied in Scotland for a year, and I had a huge monster crush on a, another American guy who was there, same major, English major, and we were... It never went more than friends. We both dated other people, but I always liked him. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, I would like to write what I would have loved to, what I would have loved to have happened in that story. And so I wrote a fictional version of that year with other people who got to do the things that I didn't. Um, but I initially I wanted to be book. a YA author because I was a high school English teacher and I mm. taught teens and I was like, how cool if my books were in the library here and I wrote a YA dystopian when nobody needed a new YA dystopian. It was like, that was, you know, hunger, hype of Hunger Games and Divergent and all that stuff. And I tried getting an agent with it and I didn't. And so then I pivoted because I started reading New Adults. Like you mentioned Cora Carmack's Losing It. Like that was my gateway to New Adult. I mm. loved that book so much. Um, losing It, sorry. Um, and that was a college student and her professor. I mean, come on. Like, mm -hmm. that's awesome. And Losing Virginity. Yes. And Losing mm -hmm. Virginity because that's what it was about. Um, yeah. So it was, it was awesome. And I was like, you know what? I, I have a story here. Um but I, yeah, I didn't stay there for long. I stayed there for, you know, like a series and a half, I'd say. Um, 
and I matured and I wanted to write, you know, stuff. And, and like we were saying before, the genre didn't go marketing wise where we could flourish in it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like you said, like a lot of it's like darker now. I'm, I'm, I'm reading a dark romance right now. A very dark one. A very dark fanfic romance. Y'all, I have been... You're I, reading dark fanfic romance? What's the fanfic? I have been, I have been influenced by TikTok. I'm reading Manacold. What's the, what is it a, uh, a fan fiction of? Harry Potter. Who's the... Wow. Lay it out. Lay it out! So like who, this was who my whole my whole break. Whenever I was on TikTok, I somehow my whole FYP was manacled book talk, book talk. Okay. Um, so manacled is um, a reimagining of Harry Potter. Um, if Voldemort won, Harry and Ron and all the good guys are dead except mm. for Hermione, and it is a mashup of what if Voldemort won. And it turned into The Handmaid's Tale, where they are going to repopulate the magical world by, by turning people like Hermione into a surrogate for Draco Malfoy. My what? daughter, my daughter and I are co- it's on Spotify because you can either you can either read it or it's on Spotify. My daughter and I are co-listening to this together, and I'm like, I'm like it. I don't. I I just. I, I've been influenced. So it's Hermione I'm, and Draco? Yeah, and it's... Oh, I'm... I'm, I'm I was I like, this book. is... Yeah, I was like, this is so up Leah's alley. And how do you find it? So I just went on Spotify, because I heard that... But I mean, if you wanted to read it with, like, your eyeballs. Oh, it's... There's a few fanfic sites. I would just Google Manacled, and you'll find it, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, Google okay. it. I just Googled it. So and they've I'm never... Sorry, and I, they took us, a, I took this off, off ramp, but I'm like, I can't believe I'm reading this, and I'm not stopping. <laughs> So I do, I do think that, you know, like publishing wise, it didn't go, new adult didn't go where we wanted to go, like for us to be super successful with it. Um, And so I think that's another reason why we all kind of like, you know, aged up, but like we aged up too. And so what we were looking for in stories, I think changed as well. Um, I was in my late thirties when I started, you know, writing new adult. And I still, like I said, I had a story to tell. So that's why I started there. But yeah. literally, as soon as I finished, I was like, I need to do something less angsty now, too. Like I wanted to, like I go back and forth. Like sometimes my sometimes my books are heavy on the, on, on the comedy and light on the angst. And sometimes they're heavy on the angst and just a little bit of like, you know, comic relief. And so I do, I go back and forth with what I need to have, you know, in my life you know, day after day while I'm working on it. Um, and you can get burnt out from the angst after doing mm-hmm. it for book after book after book. Right. Yes. But I would also say, I think, I think both of us or all of us just kind of were on a writing journey. So yeah, it was like for sure. at the time that fit us. And I didn't then, think I'd be writing you know, cowboys back then. I didn't think Who I'd knew? be writing alien romance. <laughs> Amazing where, where life takes us. Huh? Yes. Um, Okay, so why don't we share one reason we think Duna is a new adult romance? For me, it's because there's messiness in it. And so the things that frustrate people in terms of poor decision making. <laughs> right. And just like longing or making the wrong choice or being selfish or not like missing each other. Like I'm going to try now, you're pulling away, you're trying now, I'm pulling away. That's just all new adult to me. Yeah. Um, I wrote like the intensity of their love and um, attraction. Because sometimes I think just like the intensity of that first love is just a lot. Like it's intense. Consuming. Yeah, it's intense. <laughs> yeah, I wrote messy too. Like, the, <laughs> yeah. Like, that's why I was laughing because I was like, that's my answer. Um, no, but like, <laughs> but like, not just. Like, the messiness of, like, how they navigate the relationship, too, right? Like, they don't know – they don't know how to talk about their feelings. They don't know how to articulate what's going on with them. You know, yeah. like, like, Duna has to test herself. She doesn't understand how she feels. And so it is – yeah, it's a big, huge mess. Um, but I, I love that about it. 
I think that's one of the great things about new adult is to be able to like be in that mess and see how you get out of it. And then what about any comps? So I was just thinking of some right before we got on and not, not all necessarily new adult, but I thought our beloved summer was a good one. Yeah. Um, because it is first love. And then we come back when they're kind of in that newer adult stage, they've kind of, you know, they, they're finding their way in their careers and stuff like that, but love is still a really messy thing. Um, mad for each other. They are not necessarily new adults in this one, but we've got the forced proximity. We've got messy, messy love. Like mm -hmm. these are definitely people who don't know how to navigate a relationship. Um, and so that it still has that sort of like angst aspect to it. And I thought another good one was also fight for my way. Oh yeah, I forgot about fight for my way. That's de mm, I would definitely yeah. say they're they're a new adult. They're they're yeah, friends living friends living with friends and still trying to you know trying to figure out careers. And, and that's and, actually they talk about that in fight like fight. Yeah. For, that's a huge plot point that the characters talk about. They're like we're at this point in our lives where we're not kids, but we're not they, we don't feel like yeah. adults. And do you and like and what do you put first kind of thing? And I think that yeah. is part of the mess of new adult too. Is like what do I what is what do I focus on first right now? Do I focus on my career? If, if I have to do something for my career that will negatively affect my relationship, like, is it worth it kind of thing? And I think that's a big part yeah. of it too. Oh my God. You have no, like when you're a new adult, you have no idea how to prioritize. You no. know what I mean? Yeah. Prioritize oh is the word I'm looking at, looking yeah. for. Yeah. Um, so I said number one for me is tempted. Uh, so I think I'm the only one who watched this. Uh, this was um, kind of a, retake on um cruel intentions so if you want absolutely messy messy new adult like a little dark too like reminiscent of like the new adult books popular around like 2015 tempted is it tempted is just a whole mess of young people doing really stupid shit okay <laughs> and really terrible shit anyway uh i also said my roommate is a gumio and then also semantic error. And even though I didn't see nonetheless, I know enough about it to know that non nonetheless is pretty, pretty new adult. Do you mean nevertheless? Oh, nevertheless. I'm sorry. <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> and for me, I'm going to go for one that's like actually not, but like I'm going to make a connection, which is imagine reply 1988 if they all move out of the alley into like their first for sure. Sure house. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Absolutely. They were sort of new adult at the end of Reply Nights. Yeah. So I kind of like them living on their own at the end. Yeah. Yeah. So it's time for our favorite part of every episode, which is our K-pop wreck of the week. Do you have any recommendations for us this week? I do. And I'm actually really excited. Um, so I've recommended Itzy before. Um, Itzy, it's I-T-Z-Y. I love them. They're a five-member girl group and I just love their whole vibe. Again, it's a lot of like girl power, um, confident type songs, but they have a new song out called Mr. Vampire. And it's very different from what they've done before in terms of uh, like the musicality. A lot of their songs before to me were just super catchy and this one's a little bit different, but it still has a really great chorus and it's like sexy, you know, they're, like they like they talk, they say like, bite me, Mr. Vampire. I can't sing, so. <laughs> but it's just, I, I just, I love it. And like, they always look amazing. I just really adore these women and I kind of root for them every time they have a comeback even if i don't love the songs but i really really do like mr vampire so i really recommend it and i hope you check it out so it's uh mr vampire by itzy if you enjoy our podcast you have our patrons to thank at least in part afternoon of delight patreon allows us to keep creating content for y'all to enjoy thank you so much to everyone who is supporting us there and not to brag, but our Patreon community is pretty awesome. And you can join at a tier that feels good to you. Gain access to fun perks like K-drama posts, monthly Patreon-only bonus podcasts, and even a live K-drama support group on Zoom. Because we know firsthand what it's like to have no one to talk to about those crazy plot twists, amazing characters, and all those feelings. And look, no one should have to walk that walk alone. So learn more by visiting afternoonadelight.com. That's www 
www.afternoonadelight.com. And hey, while you're on the website, you can check out Afternoon a Delight podcast merch, find links to book recommendations, bop along to our K-pop recs, blow up your skin with K-merch recs, find all of our social media and a link to our email so you can send us recommendations or feedback. And hey, while you're at it, why don't you pop over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review? It really helps with our discoverability. Gamsamnida. All right, well, we are moving into the spoiler section now. So if you have not watched Duna... <laughs> it took us a while. It did, Everyone's yeah. like, oh my God. <laughs> when are you going to talk about the drama? <laughs> so we're in the spoiler section now. If you haven't seen Duna, go watch Duna. Mm-hmm. If you have good. seen it, here we are. Okay. It's only nine episodes. Go watch it. I watch it in two days. Yeah. So <laughs> love triangles. This drama has one. Thoughts on how it was handled. Okay. I guess I'll go first because I'm, cu- I actually am very curious what you guys have to say, but um, so I'm on the record as liking love triangles, like the least out of all of us. And when Leah did insinuate to me, that there was like a girl from Wan Jun's past that resurfaces. I was not as excited about starting Duna, but she was like, trust me, it's really good. And I'm like, okay. But I really, the way this one was handled was glorious. I loved both female characters so much. They, as soon as you make the female characters friends in a love triangle, it's instantly more amazing to me. You know, I, I don't I don't like it when the, I think what to me, a traditional love triangle always has like the two women at odds or the two men at odds. And I don't always love that. I think I don't always love that that angst part of it. And so um, I love Jinju's character. She was kind of the second female lead and she was very well developed. Uh, she had a backstory that was heartbreaking, but also written very well. Um, you know, there are reasons that she had uh, never given in to her attraction to Wan Jun in the past. And when she finally felt ready, he had moved on emotionally. And, you know, that happens. Mm-hmm. And it's sad. But I, God, I love this love triangle. I really, I can't believe I'm saying that. I but know. I really, really did. Um, and I would say for a new adult age group, the way these characters communicated uh, was really well done. I mean, I'm, I'm honestly, most new adult books are way more messy than this one in some parts. But uh, like, I was really impressed with the scene. I think Amy might have alluded to the scene before, but maybe not. So Wan Jun and Jin Ju are watching fireworks. And that's she basically is like, lays out her feelings to him. She's like, here's the deal. I do still, I have feelings for you now. I'm ready to date you if you're ready to date me. I'm paraphrasing, Mm -hmm. obviously. And he was honest with her and said, you know what? I'm not there anymore. Like I was, but that you're not who's in my heart anymore. And she like took it, which I would have been like, nah. (laughs) She's like, if I don't say it, like if I don't say it, I'm going to regret it. So I just have to say it. I just have to unburden myself on you. And he took the burden and then was honest with her back. And I, I freaking love that scene. I really did. I, it was good. Do, would I have reacted that way? At, I don't know however old she was, 22. No, because I was a drama queen. But yeah, I love the scene. There's so many other parts. I mean, when Duna and Jinju were like, were like buddies, like drinking together. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I loved all of that. I love that Duna didn't see Jinju as a threat. And I think Jinju sort of saw Duna as a threat, but she also, I think Jinju knew it was about, her, about timing. It wasn't really about yeah. Duna, you know? Yeah. Right. That's, that's like, I, I mean, I love love triangles to begin with, but this might be one of my favorite love triangles in a K drama. I thought Jinju was amazing and her friendship with Duna was so mature and came from such a place of love like, I love when when Duna has decided that she's going to go back to singing and she knows that she's going to have to break Wan Jun's heart. She just goes to Jinju's place. Um, I think it's like, the, it might even be like the night before. It's, it's really close to it. And she tells Jinju that she can't believe that Jinju doesn't hate her. And Jinju's response is 
like this is the one that I was talking about that's so wise and well beyond her maturity, but I love the, Mm -hmm. I forgot about the fireworks one too. Um, Like I would not have been this mature. She tells Duna that hating the winner just because they won doesn't make her any better of a person. Like in their situation, somebody had to lose Wan Jun's heart and somebody had to win it. And she basically tells Duna that it's not Duna's fault that Wan Jun picked her. And that scene just, oh, I forgot about this. Hit me right. And then she, and then, and then Duna leans her head on, on Jinju's shoulder because Duna is heartbroken because she has to do, she has to make a tough decision. And so she went to her friend and the fact that she could go to, to Jinju for this really hard time in her life, um, showed that that was like a real friendship and that, that Jinju was emotionally mature enough to still be there for Duna. Like, that was mm-hmm. fucking mind-blowing. Right, kind she of like, was there for her. Like, I mean, would it, people still be, like, even at our age, I don't think that we're that mature. <laughs> no, it's, I'm saying, like, that is wise beyond your years, like, to, to understand that and to be able to articulate it like that. That, like, why should I hate you just because you won? It's not your fault. And you know what? Fuck Jinju's dad. Fuck him. Yeah, fuck him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fuck he was him. a bad guy. Terrible. All right, so... What's a favorite moment? Okay. I got to talk about the first do it. kiss. Yep, do the kiss. Which which I already knew about because you talked about it before and you were so, I don't I don't remember which episode it was, but like I was like I know it's going to happen, but it's still amazing. Yeah. So I did talk about about the first kiss on a podcast episode. I'm sorry if you're hearing this twice. I don't you know what? I, actually no, no, don't I'm not be sorry. sorry. It's a good kiss. I'm not sorry. Mm-mm. It's a great kiss. And it was all it was the way it was shot. So credit to the director for this one. Uh, because it was the way it was shot. I mean, obviously it was the characters too and the act- actors, but Duna surprises Wan June and leans forward and kisses him. And he kind of like is very surprised and he leans back and ends up almost like half sitting on the kitchen counter. And the shock of the kiss, he moves his arm and this kind of like bucket of ice falls to the ground. And, the, and it's slow motion this like kiss the ice falling and there's no background music it's just the sound of the the ice clattering and it just to me it was like i mean i think i watched that scene with my mouth open like just holy crap just the intensity of the kiss the quietness with like um it just everything about it i think i messaged leah just like screaming like in in capital capital letters i was just like that kiss the ice i'm i'm i was like this drama now is has me in a chokehold like that was all i needed um it that is a kiss scene i will remember forever one of my top favorite k-drama kiss scenes of all time it's a really good kiss it's a great kiss yeah it's i and then amy how about you okay Um, like I said, I, I loved all the deep emotion in this, like it was intense and I, I love feeling that sometimes. And this was one of those times when I wanted to feel it. And this is after Duna goes back and Wan Jun stays away and she seeks him out. She sneaks out of her, you know, watched apartment or you know because she's being monitored all the time she sneaks out finds his new apartment where he's living and basically goes there and rips him a new one for <laughs> for not for not going after her when mm-hmm. when he said that there was you know there was nothing that would you know keep him from her that you know that she if she wanted to go back to performing that he wanted to hear her sing she's like well, how could you tell me that you wanted me to do this that you wanted to hear me sing and now you won't even see me And he starts crying and he says, you're right. I should have fought for us. And they hug. And I, I mean, like I was a snotty mess. Me too. And I loved, and I loved it. And I loved it. He's sobbing. Yes. Oh, and you know, I mean, it was like, it was the final straw. Like she's banging on his door and like yelling at him in the hall and people are coming out in the hallway and he's like, okay, fine. Let's talk inside because he's trying to stay away from her. Cause like they, they had met and he said, no, we like, she's like, it's only going to be a couple of years mm-hmm. until I can be independent and out of this contract and whatever. And like, why can't we, you know, be together in secret? Um, and he's just like, no, for reasons. And we'll talk about that later. Um, and he says that, 
you know, he doesn't want to be with her anymore. And then, yeah, that she comes back after him. And I was like, yes, like, I love that she is fighting for him. Like, I mm-hmm. loved that. Mm-hmm. That was unexpected to me. Like, I thought, like, when she first left, I thought that she was like, this is, he's just going to have to be a casualty of me finally doing my music on my own terms kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and she wouldn't let that happen. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I like the mirroring. So I like the two big emotional swoony things, which is the one where he's like, you know, tell me you're sorry. And she's like, I'm sorry. And he's like, tell me you like me and not him. And she's like, I love you. And then at the end when she does, like, I love the mirroring where it's like, you know, she's basically like, I'm holding you accountable now because it was a really big power move when he did it to her. Yes. And at the end when she did it back to him, it was interesting because the person who is demanding those things is not in the position of power in that scene. And so it's interesting to see at the beginning, she's very much in the position of power and he's like demanding his space and his, mo- his, my time. <laughs> and at the end we see that like in her mind, he has all the power now and she's demanding it. I love that. Love it. Me so too. Much. I loved it so much. I was on the airplane just like, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, like so many feelings. And here's what's really funny. When I was like midway through the drama, I like I knew you guys both loved it. And I was like, I don't I, I don't know that I'm going to warm up to Duna like you guys did because I love Jinju so much. Mm-hmm. And then the way that Duna just pulls you in like mm-hmm. Susie. She's amazing. She's amazing. And she's probably the most beautiful person I've ever seen in my life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> insane. Yeah, insane. She's ageless as well. Absolutely. ageless. but yeah, I. <sighs> I mean, she's generally, gener- she's genuinely unlikable yes. at the beginning. Yes. But that made me like her more. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I was waiting. Like, I was like, okay, how, yeah. how is she going to pull, it, pull the old switcheroo and make me fall in she love with does. her? And she does. She does. She does. So is there anything that you wish that the K-drama included? So, Okay. I would say that this drama left some things open to interpretation and not just the ending, which we're, we're going to get to soon. Um, and I think by the end of the drama, like I was okay with that. So other viewers might see it as scenes being left out and that's valid. That's valid. I would just say as myself, I was, I was okay with it. You know, we as viewers in Duna, from my perspective, we weren't always told everything about why a character made the decision they did. We sometimes had to infer it or maybe be a little confused about the decision because I think often the characters themselves were unsure about why they made the decisions they did. Um, In the scene when Duna, when, you know, Duna and, and Wanjun like run away to have this like romantic time at this, I guess, camp cabin park, place i don't know where they are that looked like the house where she grew up i mean i don't know all i know is they were like away together somewhere on vacation it looked like somewhere because it looked it looked like somewhere where she was when she was younger but i don't remember yeah it was her grandma's house That's what i, I thought it was her oh grandma's house. okay yeah. see i didn't i didn't know that but um and and the manager shows up and basically says get in my car and this manager is, you know, someone who had emotionally manipulated her since she was like a teenager. Yeah, that was the toxic relationship I was talking about from earlier. So toxic. Yeah. And she she did. She left. She gets in the car and she leaves Wan June. Even if even when he's like, do not leave me. She does. And I really think in the car, she wasn't quite sure why she did it either. And, th- and that's just my interpretation. And, I mean, eventually she, you know, m- makes the, her manager stop the car. She has, like, a full-on breakdown. She's like, take me back. Because I do think she is so messed up in her head. She's like, why, why am I making decisions? What do I want? What are my priorities? Um, and so I was, I was kind of, I was okay with that. Like, some people might have criticized her decision, but I'm like, I don't know. And even knew if she knew, I don't think she necessarily knew what she was doing. And um, 
when Wan Jun refused to see Duna again, when she began work, when when he refused to see Duna, when she began working as an idol again, he didn't necessarily explicitly give us a reason. Like we know, kind of, the manager threatened him and said, "You'll ruin Duna's career if anyone finds out about you. You'll, you know, it, it'll be all your fault." And but he never really, you know, told us or told Duna. Uh, we kind of had to just infer it based on that conversation with this manager. Mm -hmm. And and I also think he was probably a little scared. I mean, he probably had no idea what to expect. He was just, again, an ordinary guy who you know, was that being thrust into this relationship with, uh, with an idol. And so, you know, I just feel like there were a lot of character decisions that were made that we didn't necessarily know all the reasons, but I was also okay with that because I don't think the character did, characters did either. And again, people might have other interpretations, and I think that that's okay. But that is how I came away from the drama. It was like young characters being confused about what to prioritize and what to do with their lives, basically. Yeah, I have nothing else to add to that. That's perfect. Like, I totally agree with you. I don't, and I don't think. Again, going back to the director and his subtleties for the way that this is directed, I love that we understood, even if it was never explicitly stated. Right. I th Yeah, like, I think I understood the drama very well, but I can't, I also can't say, well, this was explicitly stated in the drama. I can't, I can't say that. I just feel like I know based on what the characters had done, but I also like that. Like, let me, like, project myself kind of on these characters in a way, because that's what I kind of felt like I was doing that. I was like seeing myself sometimes in these characters and the decisions they were making. Hmm. Anything missing for you, Leah? Um, I think I was just looking since I like K-pop and I'm kind of always fascinated with just like the fucked up dynamics that like there's just so much that's weird in K-pop that is interesting to me. Like the need to have foster this appearance of perpetual avail availability like mm -hmm. be boyfriend or girlfriend material always um hiding your personal life the fact that they talk about scandals and the scandals could be like you're seen like eating pizza with someone <laughs> like it's insane and so i think i was i would have taken more of that to be honest i mean this drama touches on it but i could have got i don't want to have like a, that have been the whole thing i did like that i was quote back to the basics but i could have taken more of the of that and interesting too because bay suzy was an idol yeah yes so kind of interesting that she because her character obviously did criticize the industry and it was i was kind of interested about that i was like hmm, i wonder what bay suzy herself thinks i'm just curious <laughs> yes not that she'll ever say anything publicly but no. i'm so curious <laughs> and i would i would have taken a bodyguard in there somewhere even if it was just oh. a kindly even if it was just a kindly bodyguard oh my god <laughs> Like, if, what if it was a great female bodyguard? That would have been badass. Okay. Anything you want to unburden yourself at with this drama? I mean, I just want to give a shout out to Yang Sejong, who is Won Jun, is 31 IRL, playing <laughs> 21, and I fully bought it. But I dare you to go look at pics of him with a little bit longer, wavier hair. Good fucking lord. <laughs> He's hot. Oof. He was... He's beautiful so attractive in this drama i've seen mm -hmm. him in a few other things this mm -mm, this character and just and it was everything. one of those things where i saw when i saw like clips of the drama i was like yeah he's cute but he's like a young kid and then i watched the drama i was like oh damn oh no oh yeah. damn oh yep i was thinking the same thing i was like oh god i'm not, I'm not usually into like the young college whatever but he plays this with a maturity Ugh. that you can he's you can see he's 30 i buy he's 21 but i'm like he played this oh with like the maturity the, of a 31 year old yes the, and like okay i know i talked about that first kiss scene but then there is like a good minute and a half to two minutes where they're just making out outside under a bridge and i am like and it's all it is is like the sounds of yes. them kissing and there's mm -hmm. mouth sounds and up I'm against like, up against the wall up against the, the wall. bridge and the, she tries to walk away at one point and he like brings her back Shoves mm -hmm. her against the wall. I'm like, like, <laughs> the bacon. You know, make that so noise again. That was, no, that was good. That was, you can't replicate that. That was, in I the could moment. have taken, I loved, I loved it. If you can't tell, 
loved it, loved it. <laughs> I guess let's get to the ending, right? Yeah, let's get to the ending. The ending of this drama is controversial. Mm-hmm. What was your initial reaction and thoughts after it settled? So I almost wish we had someone who didn't like the ending and could like maybe debate us about this. Cause, but you know what? I don't want to debate. <laughs> no, I don't want no, to debate. No, there is no debate. I would like lose my fucking mind. Okay. You're right. All right. So look, first of all, I cried the entire last episode. I, I mean, just constant weeping. And I was okay with that. I actually really enjoyed myself, believe it or not. It was cathartic. It was. It was so cathartic. And I cried at the end. And I would say my initial reaction, like when I realized it was like end credits, I felt a little hollow. Uh-huh. Because I was just sort of sitting there. Like, what? Like, this is it? And it felt like a little unfinished. And I'll first say, I did know going in hey, this ending's controversial. And to be honest, that's all I wanted to know. I actually want, personally, I wanted the heads up. I wanted the heads up that the ending was maybe not going to be a traditional happily ever after. And I was glad that I knew that because then I could brace myself. I knew too, yeah. Still, I was so emotionally invested. But I would say that when kind of that emotional dust settled uh, and the tears dried... I really did feel a sense of peace for these characters. They were happy in the end, separately. But I also fully believe, and especially after talking with Leah, like they are together. For me, it's a happily ever after. They're dating. They're dating in secret. They're happy. They're in love. They're doing their mouth sounds all the time. (laughs) So, and you know what? I don't think anyone can convince me otherwise. And even even if the writer of the freaking drama comes out and is like, nope, they're not together. (laughs) You know what? I don't care. Screw you. Screw you. This is art. And I'm allowed to interpret it how I want. Yes Yes to interpretation, but also to Leah sending me (laughs) written evidence to help me. (laughs) Or that. I needed, I needed, I I was, I was a mess i'm like i don't know what to think what i ugh. and then she's yeah. she sent me an article i don't know if she, it, it, have, have you sent it to megan too i, I was, don't think you sent it to me but it's okay i don't need it it might but, okay. it might be something that you found found later too but it was okay. i mean ba- basically like all of the clues as to why that last episode actually shows yes they are dating okay um, and i believe one, it and one of them was even like when he was with his manager like they're you know in japan and they, you know, they pass, they kind of, you know, cross paths with Duna um, and his manager, like, even turns around and is like, what was all the commotion? Because people are like, it's Duna, it's Duna. And Juan June doesn't turn around. And the article said that if he didn't know she was there, he would have been like, what's all the commotion? Yeah, but if but he, he knew, knew and they were meeting up in Japan, I mean, they're both yeah. in Japan at the same time. They're meeting up later. Yeah. They're doing but anyway, I need, but I, I was, I was so like emotionally hollow like you said like i knew it was an ambiguous ending but i didn't know the credits were gonna come then i know (laughs) me too me too i I was was like like, holy shit like that's it they're just walking away from each other and the credits come i was like what 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 i know Um, know. and so leah talked me off of a ledge and assured me that there is no argument they are together i mean like i've had people who read my books uh and they have a certain interpretation of these characters not how i intended it at all and not how i wrote it but you know what i don't give a shit interpret it right. how you want it is what reader. you get from it right yeah it's what you get from it if that's what you believe but then, do then not it's, it's do true. not at us on social media and tell us we're wrong i don't want yeah you, i don't want your don't evidence to the contrary I don't. <laughs> don't i don't care don't at us we think it's a happily ever after yeah. and we're sticking by it yeah i mean you could at me i just don't give a shit so <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> so you're not gonna, like no one's gonna like convince me and make me be like oh like I've read about it I thought about it. so my daughter actually spoiled the drama for me when I was flying but she spoiled it incorrectly she was like they don't even get together because she watched oh. it and so I was prepared to go in well I was oh. pissed I was she like, watched it and said that yeah so I was like thank you Bronte so Does on she the know airplane, what she watched. Okay, well, Bronte, you are no. wrong. You yeah, she was wrong. Well, she, she's a child. <laughs> I know. I and know. so, okay, if um, I grade, but if I grade that assessment, I'm sorry. That's yeah. That's and like, we're, so, being minus. we're being mean to her. <laughs> yeah. And once I talked to her about it, she was like, okay, okay. But I mean, she took it at face value, basically. Fair. And so, 
I was, when I got to it, I was sad. Then I was like, wait, that's it? What? And then I was like, that actually feels like they're together to me. And then I like went back and watched it like again. And I was on a plane. So I watched it again. And I'm like, no, they're to- like, they're together. And then I like got off the plane and was like, still like in LAX customs. And I'm like, well, actually, I'm going to prove I'm right. And I like looked up things. And I saw people like backing up the things I'd seen mm-hmm. about like the clothing choices and like some of the like the lines that were said. But also, I would just say that like, look, the end of Crash Landing on You, we have Siri and Captain Re, um like they're enduring being away from each other. They don't get to have a lot of communication yet. They have their own happy ever after that's like in their own certain way works yeah. for them. And it's, and it's stolen moments of perfect in an overall life of a lot of separation. And I felt like Duna was exactly that. Like it's the life of an idol. Like you're choosing to love somebody who essentially needs to, look unattainable for now, like not forever. At some point their heart can flutter and they can get pregnant and all of a sudden, boom, it's done. But like for right now, that's where they are. And because I was like, even when he was like smiling at the cake and stuff, I was like, he's not smiling. Like he's not, he's smiling. That was the first time he'd smiled since she left. Yeah. And I'm like, he's thinking of her and he's going to get the thing. And like, they know they're close by each other, but like they're both doing different work. But like, and so that idea of them walking right past each other and her turning and he keeps walking, that wasn't like a wistful, like, I wish we could have been together. I guess we missed each other. To me, it was like, think of how many idols are just walking around having those exact moments all the time. Oh, so many. Like having like to walk everyone. past the person because, they love and pretend like they don't exist. Yeah, because yes. they do secretly date. I mean, and so... Of it, course, so, you're not taking yeah. beautiful, beautiful, attractive people in their sexual prime and being like, and they all just go home and knit socks. <laughs> <laughs> and, if they, socks. and if they did, I'd she be wore toe socks. Oh, she did. she wore toe socks. We didn't bring that up. She wore pink. He got her pink toe socks. Oh my god, I loved it. And the fact that she wore them all the time. Oh, stop! I loved it. I loved it. I loved With it. her slides, she wore toe socks and slides. Toe socks and you know what? Slides. I love toe socks now. Yeah, because of Duna. me too. A couple times I was like, "Girl, those are impractical shoes, though. Can we put on some sneakers?" <laughs> like, I girl, like slides all the time. I know, but she's like sliding out of them. I was like, <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I just. I was like, they're like, as soon, and as soon as I kind of like had that realization, then everything about Duna kind of clicked into place. Like everything about the drama clicked into place for me, and I was like, this is a great drama. Like, it's, I, I actually want to go back and watch the last episode again. Mm. I think I might. So it'd be really hard. That the moment where she shows up at his apartment was so hard for me. I mean, mm-hmm. I. It's hard, but also it's also a reminder of why would she do that. And him say, I should have fought for us, and then have them not be together. Right, exactly. And how it ends is, like, you just miss, they take away the part where, like, he admits. Because, I mean, in that moment, he's also pushing back, pushing back, because there's been so much shit. And so we see she fights for him. At no point, then, does she lose and then just walk away and be like, well, I guess it didn't work out. Like, that's (laughs) not how the story goes, of course. Because they were clearly still in love. Yeah. And so what it is, is that you have to just realize that you're going to play the fucking game. And this is how the game is going to go right now. And that part I found interesting, too, especially now being interested in K-pop of just thinking, damn, like these poor, these poor people and what they are doing so that I, I mean, like, and I, I and I sometimes feel complicit about it as a fan because I'm like, I don't I need you. I don't need you to do that. I would rather you have a boyfriend or girlfriend. Like, I would rather you just be happy. This is crazy. Yeah. And I, well, now, so I guess to me, it's part of like the, like, I want to enjoy like my fandom experience. And I don't feel like I enjoy it if I feel like I'm like exploiting you or that eventually you're just going to have to peace out because you're like, I need a life. Which is what happened to her. Like the anxiety of it all got to her. Yeah, and like the loneliness because she was lonely on stage. I think there was a lot of he, like drowning metaphors and things like that. Oh yeah, that didn't, and she even you know, talked about how like even though I'm in, I'm in a group with all these girls, we're not friends. Like because they're coworkers. Yeah, it's not like they were like a band formed by. They're not like the Beatles who are like friends. They're like you know yeah. what I mean. They're like a. They're like the boy groups formed by. One Direction. I don't know. Yeah, like. Uh, in sync and all them just formed by some like guy so yeah I mean I I I just have so many happy thoughts about this drama and I think it's because I just I I actually really loved 
having a condensed romance drama. I, I truly did. Yeah. It too. was my top drama of 2023. I think it was up there for me, for sure. Well, I know it was up there for me. I don't know if it was my top, but it was for sure up there. It was, I loved it very much. So, yeah, it. if you have a different interpretation of the ending, that's cool. Just, we don't need, I don't need to hear Good about it. You. <laughs> you can tell me. I'm just not going to, like, change my mind. If we're, you want to yeah, te- tell me, sure. We're going to give you a thumbs up and move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you'll get a thumbs up you'll get a thumbs up and we'll... but it's not it right we're not here to debate like right because everyone interprets things uh how they want to and right. i yeah i i want I to interpret to, it the right way yeah i'm just not i'm never going to be one of those authors who was like well that's not canon i don't really i don't really care like you're the one reading my book and if you want to take something away from it even that i didn't intend i'm okay with that mm-hmm all right. Well, this has been a very long pod. We didn't touch on a lot, but we touched on the fact we liked it. Yeah, I'm sorry. We this did. was really long. We touched on some good stuff, though. So I, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy with it, and I'm happy that I watched it. So thank you for finding it on the plane home from Seoul. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Annyeong. Kamsamnida. Thank you for listening to Afternoon of Delight. Where can you find us outside the pod? Head on over to afternoonadelight.com. That's A F T E R N O O N A D E L I G H T.com. You'll find links to all our social media, our book recs, K pop and K skincare recs. And if you want even more Afternoon of Delight, because really who doesn't, you can join our Patreon, where you can choose the patron level that's right for you. Join in daily K-drama conversations, listen to bonus podcast episodes just for patrons, and participate in our monthly live K-drama support group via Zoom. We can't wait for you to be a part of the community. Until next time, annyeong!